Our first scripture for today is one of my personal favorites, even though it's a bit of a downer. Uh, it's Psalm 22, verses 1 through 5, 15, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. My God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my anguished groans. My God, I cry out during the day, but you don't answer. Even at nighttime, I don't stop. You are the Holy One enthroned. You are Israel's praise. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you, and they were saved. They trusted you, and they weren't ashamed. But I'm a worm, less than human, insulted by one person, despised by another. All who see me make fun of me. They gape, shaking their heads. He committed himself to the Lord, so let God rescue him. Let God deliver him, because God likes him so much. But you are the one who pulled me from the womb placing me safely at my mother's breast. I was thrown on you from birth. You've been my God since I was in my mother's womb. Please don't be far from me because trouble is near and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Mighty bulls from Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths at me like a lion, ripping and roaring. I'm poured out like water. All my bones have fallen apart. My heart is like wax. It melts inside me. My strength is dried up like a piece of broken pottery. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You've set me down in the dirt of death. Our second scripture, again, not really one of the happiest ones, comes from the book of Job chapter 23, verses 1 through 9, and 16 through 17. And again, I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Job answered, Today, my complaint is again bitter. My strength is weighed down because of my groaning. Oh, that I could know how to find him. Come to his dwelling place. I would lay out my case before him. Fill my mouth with arguments. Know the words with which he would answer. Understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me through brute force? No. He would surely listen to me. There, those who do the right thing can argue with him. I could escape from my judge forever. Look, I go east. He's not there. West, and don't discover him. North, in his activity, and I don't grasp him. He turns south, and I don't see God has weakened my mind. The Almighty has frightened me. Still, I'm not annihilated by darkness. He has hidden deep 
darkness from me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this morning's message, as you can guess from the two scriptures we have today, is not of the most cheery of natures. But you know, we've kind of been through a less than cheery almost two years now. It's not been an easy time. But I wanted to start off as I usually do with a story. Um, during the pandemic, one of the blessings of pandemic life has been a lot of people have uh, lessened their Netflix queue. They've been able, we've been able to watch more TV. While I worked a lot through the pandemic, and so that didn't really happen to me too much, one show that I kind of got into was the show Fleabag. Fleabag is the story of a woman in her 30s in London who just is trying to live her life but is doing a really bad job of it. She knows that she's making a lot of mistakes. She um, is known as she is known as Fleabag. She doesn't have any other name on the show except for the title Fleabag. Um, and this is a common thing with most of the characters on the show. They don't have names, they just have titles. Um, but she makes a lot of mistakes. She dates all the wrong men. She it says inappropriate things. She just genuinely has an unpleasant um, way about her, but yet is something that's so appealing in her just outright awfulness at times. But in the second season of the show, what becomes really interesting is she becomes friends with a priest, a young, very attractive priest that she decides she wants to have a relationship with. It becomes more complicated, but they do develop a really good friendship. And one day, as she and the priest are walking along the street, they get into this conversation where he asks her which she prefers better, weddings or funerals. To which, of course, she says weddings, and he happens to say funerals because he sees the value in thinking about the next life, of dwelling in that opportunity. And of course, she's an atheist, and so this brings up the question of, is there a next life? To which his response is one of my favorites that I've ever heard on television talking about um, the question of why have faith. He says to her, why would you believe in something awful when you can believe in something wonderful? And that to me, like, I feel like sums up the whole reason to have faith. You can easily believe that everything is doom and gloom and that we die and nothing after that, but why would you when you can believe that there's something awesome that connects us all? That's just a story to get us started on a slightly brighter note. Because the story of Job is not a very bright point. For those of you that are not quite fully aware of the story of Job, I'm just going to give a brief synopsis. Um, so a quick context is that the book of Job starts out with God and this group of celestial beings, all known as the sons of God in the Bible. And they're gathered in what kind of seems like a um, sort of a staff meeting, basically. They're sort of just picture this celestial staff meeting where they're all getting together to talk about what's going on in the world and how they can innovate, how they can make things fresh and new, what's going on, who, what, who's doing a good job at what. And God brings up his servant, Job. And he says, look at my servant, Job. Look at all the wonderful things he is doing. He is a true man of faith. He abides by me. He serves me. Look at how much he has profited because he continues to serve me in an ethical and loving and caring way. And then this one celestial being known as the Satan comes up out of the group and poses this to God and says, well, yeah, he's serving you. He's doing a great job, but look at his life. His life's pretty easy. 
He has a loving family. He has all the money he could ever want. He's never had need for anything. So serving God is a pretty easy thing when God's doing everything for you. So you just keep moving along. He says, I think that maybe Job is serving you because why not? It's easy for him. And the Satan poses, what if we tested Job? To find out if he would still serve you and still be faithful to you if he didn't have all of that. And God is curious by this idea. And so God, get, God tells us a time, yes, you may test Job. You can do whatever you want to him short of taking his life. He must stay alive. But other than that, test him in whatever ways you want. And of course, what ends up happening is horrible. Job just goes and loses everything. His servants, his livestock, his family, they all die. His fortune is either stolen or destroyed, and everything is devastated. And he is left in the middle of the wilderness with absolutely nothing left to his name. And at first, sure, when left stranded and alone, he continues to go on and praise God and recognize that God is with him. He falls down to the ground and calls out to God. But after a while, Job begins to go back and forth between his loyalty and his love of God and his anger that God could allow something like this to happen because Job had done everything right. Job had been a faithful servant. Why would God do this to him when Job had done everything God had asked? And so Job is tormented by this because he has done everything that he was supposed to. And a group of his friends come along and the idea at the time was, well, if you're punished like this, it's because you've done something to deserve it. And so his friends go on to question him and to challenge him and to think about, well, then you must have done something for God to be willing to punish you in this way. And Job is fed up. He's had enough. His friends are trying to either tell him that he's done something wrong and he deserves this, or that he's not being gracious enough, he's not doing the right thing, he's, they're trying to prescribe to him what he should be doing in order to get his life back on track. And Job is fed up. And so that is where we come to in today's scripture. Job is bitter. Job is angry. Job is in despair. He feels truly alone and abandoned. Now we often talk about how God's presence is always with us. But do we always feel that presence? Both today's psalmist and the story of Job point to this feeling of utter abandonment. They are crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The same words that Christ says on the cross as he takes his final breaths. They ask the question, is God truly just, fair, and loving? And when we look at the state of the world today, where people value profit over human life, where is God? Where brown and black bodies feel fear rather than protection from law enforcement, where is God? Where disease and death has rocked the entire world infrastructure, but people refuse to be vaccinated, where is God? where human error has led to the destruction of the very planet God gave us, where is God? When we experience the 
pain of watching a loved one suffer, where is God? And when we ourselves feel isolated and all alone, where is God? I know that this message is one that we struggle to hear. You want me to offer you hope and state the claim that God is present in all these situations. And believe me, God is. And while I believe truly in God's presence in all these places, that doesn't make the silence of inaction any less deafening. You see, both the psalmist and Job are true men of faith. They have done the right things. They have been at God's side. They have prayed. They have worshipped. They have dedicated their lives to God. Throughout both texts, the fact that they continue to pour out their hearts to a God they feel has cast them aside is proof that they remain faithful. They continue to believe in God despite feeling all evidence that God has abandoned them. Maybe this is a feeling that you're unfamiliar with. Maybe you've been fortunate enough to always be secure in the knowing that God is an absolute presence in your life. But I guarantee you that there have been people in your lives who have not been as secure. Depression and anxiety are increasingly common in this world as we continue to add on more pressures and stress on every generation to do better than the one before. I remember as a teenager hearing a sermon where I was told that depression was a choice and that it was choosing to allow darkness to control your life. As someone who has suffered depression my whole life, I was absolutely devastated to hear this. I left that service in tears. But as I left that service, I pulled out my Bible and I turned to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I found comfort in the knowing that I was not alone in my suffering. As the psalmist declared, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I felt validated in my feelings of despair. I wasn't at a place yet where I could see the hope, but I knew that I was no longer alone. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is not our job to act as Job's friends did and counsel and prescribe solutions when people are in pain. Let us not question the suffering or offer well-meaning platitudes. Instead, it is our job to be with them in solidarity. When someone feels abandoned by God, let them know they have not been abandoned by you. For each one of us is an ambassador to God's kingdom. When we are in relationship with one another, we are in the presence of God. God cannot and God will not abandon us so long as we share the love of the kingdom with all that we meet. God sees us where we are. When we suffer, whether we feel it or not, God suffers alongside us. And when we feel joy, God is there to delight in all of our lives' victories. Like a loving parent, God continues to love us, cherish us, and sit beside us even when we do not recognize the presence in our midst. So feel free to go to God with all of your emotions. Celebrate with God all of your joys. Cry with God when you need to cry and scream out to 
God when you feel abandoned. No matter what, God will still be there, understanding and loving, ready to embrace us and work within our lives in ways we have yet to imagine. Let us continue to offer our presence, our love, and our support to our neighbors in need so that they may know God's presence through our love. All of this in God's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, today has added significance because today is the anniversary of Bob's death. Um, and so I had wanted to speak today because of that. Unfortunately, during COVID last year, it was very difficult for us to hold any kind of a service. We did with this, you know, just immediate family. Um, but this is sort of my way of bringing you guys into his life as well. Um, when I met Bob, what drew us together was the fact that we just talked and talked and talked and talked. Um, he was supposed to tutor me <laughs> in economics, but um, he, uh, uh, we ended up talking <laughs> and doing very little tutoring. Um, but what drew us together was the commonalities that we had. Uh, and one of those was the fact that he went to church um, just about, you know, a, frequently during the during growing up um, at a Presbyterian church, which was very close to where he lived in Levittown. So we had that, um, that rather a strong Christian background in common. Um, when we were after we were married in this church, which was lovely, <laughs> it was a very beautiful service, um, and um, sort of went away from the church a little bit, which happens as a young person. But when I came back into the church and I felt drawn, uh, he followed. He came with me. Um, somewhat reluctantly sometimes. <laughs> but if I was here, he wanted to be with me, so he came too. And then uh, when the kids were born, of course, um, we were much more active. And he became more active as well. And there was one pastor at one time, I'm not sure which one it was, whether it was Westinson or one of them said, well, Bob, you haven't joined the church. <laughs> you know? So, um, and he, he thought about it for a week and he goes, yeah, I should. And he decided he wanted to and be part of the church, so he did. Um, and then, of course, once he was part of the church, that means you had to give. Um, and um, he, he always did feel very strongly that faith without works was, was not acceptable, that um, you had to do something to show your faith, or had to, that's what uh, faith was about. So he became active in the church, and he um, was sort of his way of giving, and he was administrative board head for many, many years. Um, he worked on several trustees, um, I can't, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys can remember more than I can. Uh, off the top of my head, I have a hard time remembering all the, the posts that he did. Um, remembering that this was, we were married for 50 years. So um, that's a long time to be part of the church as well. Uh, and we both have done a lot. So one of the things that um, made him who he was, was the way he loved people. He was, um, very, um, he supported and loved our children and, and our family, me. Uh, he showed that love. He was very, he would tell me all the time that he loved me, always. And he would do the same to the kids. Not everybody is, is comfortable saying that as much, but he, uh, he always did that. Um, and he showed his love. Um, not only with the words, but also with his deeds as well. It was um, one of the last places that he could come and visit uh, and get out of the house uh, was either his dialysis that he was in for the last four years before he died, uh, but also church. 
and he loved to be here and to see you all and to be part of this congregation. It was very important with him. So, um, I just want to honor him today as, as a saint of this church and um, just to sort of review memories and 